Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining SLVA CPD webinar series. Um, I would like to request from you all to mute your mic. And uh, I like to invite uh, Dr. Tarandika Gunavardana, the president of Sri Lanka Vettai Association, to welcome you all. Okay, thank you very much, Sugat. Uh, uh, and uh, my dear colleagues and uh, ladies and gentlemen, and my dear doctors and uh, senior veterinarians, and especially the veterinarians who are joining with us here for, through, through our YouTube channel. And uh, when we uh, start up this webinar series, we, uh, we just uh, did a, a remarkable survey and on the, what are the requests of veterinarians in the country uh, to have these webinars or the, what are the subject areas they're lacking on. So this is one of the most uh, important area uh, came out uh, this oncology and the cancers of uh, small animal and, and uh, what we are coming across uh, during our practices. So uh, this was a very highly recognized area. So thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Senator, today. To, uh, again, we are, he's joining uh, with us here from Australia and uh, to share his uh, expertise, uh, knowledge and everything uh, with the local veterinarians and the veterinarians who are joining here with us uh, from the overseas also as well. To the hybrid platform. So, uh, and in this uh, present afternoon, uh, I would like to welcome you all for this seminar. And without taking much your time, I would invite uh, Dr. Sugas to uh, in introduce uh, Dr. Senoran and uh, continue the program. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Randika Gunawardana. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Senrada Silva, the first, uh, he obtained first class BBSC degree in 2015. He completed the national veterinary exam in 2018. And uh, he's a member of the Australian and New Zealand College of Veterinary Scientists in Small, Small Animal Surgery, currently practicing as a general practitioner an emergency clinician in Victoria, Australia. Uh, his special focus in surgical oncology, TPL surgery, in treating canine crucial ligament diseases and abdominal ultrasonography. On behalf of Sri Lanka Veterinary Association, I would like to invite our resource person today, Dr. Senra De Silva, to continue the program. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sagat and Dr. Andiga. I'll load the presentation really quickly. Can in, everyone see the presentation? Yes. Yeah, okay. So um, welcome everyone and thank you for coming today. Uh, this is a bit of an interesting area, especially for me. I, I love dealing with cancers and surgical oncology side of things. So I, I'm, I'm, this is one area that I do have quite a lot of interest in. Um, so before I start, disclaimer, I'm not a specialist in surgery, nor am I in oncology, but this is one of those areas where I'm quite keen in. Um, cancer surgery, looking at cancer surgery, I think it's one of those areas where the mindset needs a little bit of a change. Um, cancer surgery is where you can actually do a fair bit to cure a cancer. I think we have to change our mindset where we not only focus on it as, as a measure of just removing a mass, but rather as a me method of curing a cancer. And statistically, even in humans and in animals, surgery cures more cancers than any other modalities like compared to radiation, um, chemotherapy, etc. Two keywords that I wanna introduce is the word recurrence. It's basically meaning where a tumor occurs in, in the same location where the previous cancer was treated or removed. Metastasis, sorry. Metastasis on the other hand, refers to another tumor of the same type coming up in a different location. Um, I have like, when I approach cancer, I do have a few step-by-step -step process that I go through. The step one is noticing the problem. That's usually where your owner comes in with some kind of a issue or a mass, et cetera. Uh, one thing to remember is cancer does occur in all body tissues and it's not always in the form of a mass or a nodule. 
Um, you have to remember to keep it as, as an important differential um, whenever you approach a patient, um, especially when you are quite confused what the differentials could be. Um, say examples, weight loss, anemia, palpable nodules, pain, lameness, chronic GIT issues where I see a lot in Australia. Um, step number two is actually focusing on identifying what the problem is. And key focus areas to remember, I think this comes with the first, the first point comes with any, any disease process, where age, gender, the breed, body weight, et cetera, can um, be a cause of cancer or helps us localize a form of cancer. Location is a good idea of knowing what possibilities can occur. And then you do have your non-specific diagnostics where your biochemistry, x-rays, ultrasound, and et cetera. And then specific diagnostics when you had a, when you know um, and identify the mass, you know you can do your fine needle aspirates and biopsies. Um, fine needle aspirates, one of the most commonly used um, tools that we have in our practice. Um, all you need is um, a, a needle and a syringe and a slide. Uh, the main goal with a fine needle aspirate has two, two main goals. It's number one, you can differentiate whether it's an inflammatory process or a neoplastic. And if neoplastic, it can give you an idea whether it's benign or malignant. Not, conf not confirm always, but it'll give you a basic idea. Um, and in some cases, it can actually help diagnose the particular tumor as well. Common masses where FNA helps us diagnose, lipomas where I'm sure everybody has seen, mast cell tumors, less commonly than lipoma, but still common. Soft tissue sarcomas, not something that I used to diagnose in Sri Lanka, but that I diagnose now quite a bit. Um, histiocytoma, especially in the younger dogs, then osteosarcomas as well. Um, melanomas, I put a question mark there because melanomas is one of those things where just because you see mel melanocytes doesn't mean it's a melanoma. So it's one of those areas where I always like to biopsy them. Um, process of fine needle aspirate, I'm sure a lot of people do know there is two ways. The, where you fix a needle to a syringe, insert it into the tissue, draw back on the, um, the pump a little bit, push that back in, and then where you remove it completely, detach the needle, fill it with air and get it on a slide. And then you can use the needle method only where I, that's my preferred method, where I put in a needle and then drive the needle in different directions. I've left a um, link here for anyone who's interested. I will pass the PowerPoint presentation. They can go to this site and get a more detailed idea of how to do a FNA if you don't know. Um, ultrasound guided FNA, which I've started to do um, quite a bit now in practice, um, where I use it mainly for internal organs, mostly in abdominal organs, but I do do aspirate um, masses in the thorax as well. Um, the ultrasound helps to localize the lesion, as you can see this on this image where you have this nodule. This is the needle track initially, where and then the needle track aligns in a different manner, and then finally you reach the nodule. Um, and it kind of helps avoid the accidentally penetrating other organs. My biggest worry areas is your spleen, um, liver, etc., where you don't want to accidentally puncture. Um, differences, fine needle aspirates helps to give us a single layer of cells. The sensitivity depends on the user. Um, if people are good with cytology, that really helps. I'm not too good, so I do like to send it out to the labs. And inflammation can be a big factor that interferes with our interpretation. Um, biopsy and histopathology, um, it, it yields more chunkier portions of tissues. It has a lot better sensitivity. Um, because it almost ends up going to a pathologist who knows what they're doing. Um, and it helps with tumor grading, which I'll discuss what tumor grading is. Um, final aspirates, this is a very classical image of a lipoma. You get these fat cells, very eccentric, small nucleus and comes with sheets. You don't always see this on um, aspirates. You'll be quite lucky if you do aspirate and see it on a slide. Um, mast cell tumors, the scarier one, where you get these nice rounded isolated cells with tiny bluish, um, almost purple little pigments. Um, also, if there is any questions, please don't hesitate to message me while we're doing the presentation. Um, this is the more soft tissue sarcomas that I see. I can't directly say it's a soft tissue sarcoma. I can say it's a connective tissue, more spindly appearance, more oval-shaped nuclear they are in, in, in forms of sheets. 
um, and B is just extra blood contamination that's going around. Um, all right, so this is one of the newer research that came out, if I'm not mistaken, last year, um, where they looked in mainly at, at mast cell tumors and, and the different research. So out of that, there is three important findings that I do think is quite important. Um, one thing that they noticed was cytology is, is fairly accurate at grading mast cell tumors. Um, so the word grading basically means how aggressive it is. Is it something that is um, quite badly metastatic or quite aggressive, or is it something that is more towards the benign side of things? Um, but they only found that the accuracy was only with mast cell tumors. So if there is anyone who aspirates a tumor and says, oh, okay, it, it, it's benign or it's a low grade tumor versus a high grade tumor, don't trust that on it because I've had this bad experience myself as well, but it's, it's mast cell tumors. There is actual guidelines that allow people to follow. Um, some tumors don't always exfoliate. So just because you aspirate a, a tumor doesn't mean you can get um, tumor cells in it. And I do commonly find it when I aspirate liver, et cetera, where I don't get the tumor cells and that it can be that, you know, you can easily miss a tumor on a fine needle aspirate. Um, the other common finding is that they detect fat surrounding the malignancies and not the tumor itself. And I do actually have an example of this occurring. Um, going forward, why take a biopsy? Um, it does help with your accurate diagnosis of the tumor. So that will help me with my choice of treatment, whether I'm going to go ahead with surgery, whether I'm going to have, go with chemotherapy, radiation, do nothing or monitor, and then even euthanize if depending on the um, cases. Um, and then my choice of surgical treatment if I do go ahead, you know, especially with surgical margins. Um, diagnosis of the tumor grade, it helps estimate the prognosis, you know, how the surgical success is going to be, rough survival time and risk of metastases to other organs. Um, and then my choice of treatment planned where do I think is it going to be a curative um, surgical process or more to palliative where I do help the patient, you know, have a better quality of life. Um, methods of getting biopsies. Um, punch biopsy is a very common procedure. I hope it's available in Sri Lanka. Good thing is you, you have quite wide varieties, one millimeter to eight millimeters. The depth of them are fixed, so you can't go in beyond a particular point. Um, you can use it in an incisional or an excisional fashion. Incisional basically means I go into a nodule and take only a part of it out. Excisional basically means I do take out the entire little lump. So with like skin tags or et cetera, that's where that comes in. Um, you can do it on a sedate patient with some local lignocaine, um, apply the lignocaine around where you want to take the sample and give it about, you know, five minutes before you go. I don't do it when it comes to cancers because I can occasionally expect a little bit of bleeding that may need to stitch up. Um, I usually do it where uh, I'm worried about chronic skin issues. That's where you, you use lignocaine. Um, the skin must be aseptically prepped as if you're doing a surgery, uh, unless it's for uh, any skin um, uh, reasons that you want to do it. Um, and then you kind of use the punch biopsies in a twisting motion. So basically this is what a punch biopsy looks like. It goes into its particular depth and then you pull the punch biopsy out. You have to be very gentle taking the use pair of medicine and bombs to kind of twist it. Never use forceps to handle it because one of the biggest problems is crush artifacts where they use where people use rat tooth forceps, et cetera, to call, uh, manipulate this segment and then cause a lot of injury. Um, incisional biopsy, one of the most common ones that I do. It helps us take a larger tissue sample, especially for mass lesions, gastrointestinal tissue, where I you know, do at least once a month in cats and dogs, uh, especially in cats with suspected lymphoma um, and lymph nodes as well. Uh, samples should be taken at the junction of the mass and where the normal tissue um, lies. I'll show you a picture of it soon. Um, you want to take a biopsy from the tumor edge where you, know, you have the most amount of new tumor cells coming in because a lot of the times tumor centers can be necrotic. I'm sure everybody's come across a tumor where it's ruptured and all, it's, all you get is a very smelly center like an abscess. Um, the downfall or the con could be that you can introduce 
um, tumor to completely normal tissue where it wasn't there before. Um, you want to make incision parallel to the lines of tension where it does come become a big help with regards to um, your closure technique. So this is a good image. If anybody wants the image, I can send it through them as well. Where it, your incision, you want to be parallel to the lines when you make your incision because that's going to help you when you close up your wound. Um, okay. when you make your surgery. Yes. Uh, can you own my uh, video? Then uh, we can see you in the uh, one side of the screen. Yes, is that better. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, yes, so you do see this um, lines of tension where you can align your uh, masses when you're closing, etc. Um, incisional biopsy, the most common mistake that I see with my junior vets is they make this big incision into the mass and they think, oh, the bigger is better. That's definitely not the case. You want to get this nice lesion, a nice thin lesion where you, you get a nice sample and you take part of the normal tissue as well. And you can see on the second image, you take it off from the edge of the tissue where you take a normal chunk out as well. So this is what you want to experience or what you want to do rather than you take incisional biopsies. Um, excisional biopsies where it's not my ideal case scenario where you do end up taking the biggest, the chunk of the tissue as one whole thing. Um, the biggest risks with these is that you can end up with incomplete excisions. You can have with local recurrences that may need for a much bigger extensive surgery. So I'd rather do an incisional biopsy over an excisional biopsy, but it does have its place. Um, needle core biopsy, again, I know it's available in Sri Lanka because it does happen in human world. So if you are interested, that's something that you can go to. Um, I do use it more with abdominal, say with livers and um, yeah, mainly with liver that I use it for. I rarely ever use it on big masses. The only other area that I usually use it is um, when I do nasal biopsies where you insert this core into the uh, tissue, then you pull out the start, you, you insert the stylet in and then use the outer casing as like a cutting motion and then you get this nice little sample out. Um, endoscopic biopsies, um, I do use it, but not as commonly. Um, it's, it's more, I, I restrict to say colonic biopsies or when I go do stomach biopsies. Um, so if I'm worried about a gastronoma or a gastric tumor or ulcer, et cetera, this is where I go with my endoscopic. And this is where they, you know, you have this nice crocodile alligator biopsy punches that you can just tug on the tissue and pull it out. Um, a proper internal medicine specialist, they use it up to like say mid duodenum. I'm not too good at it, but I usually use it for my stomach ones. Um, sample, make sure you do not squash it or damage the sample in any way. Be quite delicate with your tissue. Um, place it into 10% formalin as soon as possible before it dries out. And make sure you end, send a good history and a description of your tumour, your size, the location, physical characteristics. If you've done an FNA, send it to your um, pathologist as well, because I'm sure all pathologists love knowing what you have diagnosed. Or it, it can help you learn more from the pathologist as well. Um, I think I'm not too sure who the available pathologists are. I'm sure the, uh, the faculty has Dr. Harsha doing them still. Um, this is a common thing that I do hear from people, especially the junior vets. They're like, I remove the mass. I hope it's benign, um, not knowing what the mass they're dealing with. Um, I hear a lot of people saying, I, I, I thought I, I removed as much as I could. And then some also hoping that it was just a light coma but in reality, it comes being something else. Um, now that you have your diagnosis, next thing is to do your homework. And I do this with every single patient that I have. Um, the biggest first thing that you have to do is your literature review. You have, this is my favorite book, The Veterinary Surgical Oncology with Simon Kudnick. Um, if you are sneaky, you can Google it and find the book quite easily online. Um, Tobias and Johnston, I think everyone who does surgery needs to have this book. Basava Oncology Manual, I rarely use it, but it is another good manual to have. Fourthly, fourth, um, the VSSO.org, which I'll show you quite um, soon, what it looks like is a very good source as well. 
Wayne.com, I'm not sure whether people have heard of it. I think it's a good resource for especially the um, uh, faculty to have because it has a lot of specialists online. You can pose questions, people don't judge you. And then I have the luxury of specialists, but you know, if you if any one of you ever come across and need more information, you can always forward it to me. If I don't know, I can forward it to a specialist and get an answer fairly quickly. So the VSSO.org um, website is is really good um it's it's you it's uh the veterinary uh i can't remember what it stands for but it is an interest group of oncology surgical oncology if you go to their website it might be divided into canine cancer feline cancer you can select by tumor type or tumor location and by tumor type as an example muscle tumors muscle all the digits skin small intestine etc and if you click it it'll tell you what your surgical margin is going to be it'll tell you what your Life expectancy is going to be, it'll tell you what other options are available if surgery is not an option. So this is a good resource for everybody to use. Um, a third, um, so surgical planning ongoing, then you want to know your general health of, the health of the patient. Is there any other concurrent problems? Are we fit for an anesthetic or a surgery? Are the hematological biochemistry panels okay? Because, you know, if you have something like an anemia, if you're worried about, especially in cases of mangiosarcomas, you want to know that you have a blood pack ready, hypercalcemia, you can have heart issues, et cetera, especially tumors like lymphoma, the anal gland, adenocarcinomas. Also knowing that you have hypercalcemia is a big prognostic indicator with anal gland adenocarcinomas, where your um, chances are it's a quite aggressive metastatic tumor. Hypoglycemia in cases of, say, insulinomas with adrenal glands or abdominal glyomyosarcoma. So if you ever get a patient having hypoglycemia, you should be worried about these cases. Um, tumor staging. Basically, what it means is with, like your regional and systemic extent of how the tumor is behaving. Um, you have your primary tumor. Um, then you have your regional lymph nodes that you have to be involved, uh, where they're involved rather, and then your distant metastases, where people, a lot of people commonly know that it does go to the lungs, but then you do have visceral organs, especially with stuff like mast cell tumors. All right, so tumor staging, primary tumor. You've done your incisional biopsy where it'll give you the type of tumor and your grade. Um, you want to look at gross and microscopic evidence where if you speak to a pathologist, they'll tell you how it's appearing around in the surrounding tissues. You want to look at your affected tissues, whether it's the leg, the skin, subcut, you know, lungs, etc. Is there any other local factors that's going to affect or is affected by the tumor? And then you can use advanced imaging like CT, MRI, which again, I don't use a lot, but I do have the access to it if I need to. Um, this is the image of lymph nodes that I refer to that I have attached to say, if I have a mass on the distant leg, I'll be worried about my popliteal lymph node and my superficial inguinal, et cetera. If it's say on the face, then I'll be worried about my mandibule and my prescaps um, and then axillary or thoracic. So you can always refer online to see what your regional path is going to be. Um, so tumor stage of the lymph nodes can be, you know, you can palpate for enlargement, you can palpate for abnormal shape where they've lost a nice bean shape, or then you can also use fine needle aspirates and biopsies, which I do recommend in every case. One important point, just because it appears normal, just because it feels normal does not mean it has not moved. Um, so it is always a good idea to take a fine needle aspirate or a biopsy and send it to your uh, favoring pathologist for further diagnosis. Um, distant metastases, where I think a lot of people do pay attention to. Oops. Um, it depends on the type of tumor and the grade of the tumor. Most common tumor location is going to the lungs, but it can move to the other visceral organs as well. Um, it does need to include your minimum uh, full blood count, a three move chest radiograph in most cases, and an abdominal ultrasound in, in a decent amount of cases. Advanced, again, if you want to be more pedantic and extra cautious, you can do CT, MRI, and bone marrow aspirate, especially with mast cell tumors that are high grade. Um, informed discussion and consent with the owner is a very crucial step that I don't think happens in Sri Lanka, and it definitely does not happen in Australia enough. It is about managing expectation. It is what, if you ever known a person who has cancer where the oncologist sits down with the patient and talks to you about, and it gives you an ideal prognosis with and without surgery. 
are you doing the right thing? You know, is it going to affect our patient quite badly after surgery? How the cosmetic result is going to be, especially if you do skin flaps, etc. cetera. Um, what are your surgical costs and the ongoing costs with these procedures? What is the post-op care that you have to do? Um, is there a risk of recurrence? What is the metastatic potential, etc.? Something that I don't really find as a big issue that affects me is age. I have done cancer removals in dogs that are 19 years old, and I've done cancer removal in dogs that are six months old. Um, and I don't consider age as a limiting factor. I consider my owner and my patient as the biggest factor. Um, are there gonna be need for adjunctive treatment? Um, and are those gonna be available for you? So just because you can remove a mask, and if it's not going to have good prognosis afterwards, I don't think it's a good case to do. You know, it's one of those things that you have to sit down and think. Um, surgical margins, where again, I have found is not a good area where people pay attention to. And this is where I kind of want to make a big influence on um, everyone who is attending today. So it is the most important factor when it comes to local tumor control. And it depends on the type and grade of the tumor and what your surgical intent is gonna be. Is it gonna be a curative intent where it should be 99% of your patients? Palliative intent where the one to 2% where you would do, especially on the request of owners. Surgical margins can be brief or are categorized into four. Your intracapsular excisions, your marginal excisions, your wide margin excisions and radical excisions. Out of which I think my most important ones are the last two. There is room where marginal excision is an option. Intracapsular excision is basically where you remove chunks of the tumor, where what we call the debulking procedure, um, where you definitely leave macroscopic tumor behind. It is not an ideal choice with regards to surgical oncology and oncologists do not consider that an option. Um, it's, it's basically for palliative intent where you're, you're deciding to give the patient a bit more extra time before he dies. But in my opinion, I, I, I don't consider debulking as an option. Marginal excision is basically where you're shelling out the tumor. Um, common uh, type of tumor is your uh, lipomas. If you go just outside the pseudocapsule, I'll put the word pseudo in brackets because a lot of the time what we consider as a capsule is not a true capsule. It's, it's basically a fibrous local tissue inflammatory process that keeps a fine the tumor margin. It often leaves microscopic tumors behind in most tumors um, and the surgical intent. Basically for benign encapsulated tumors, it's, it's a nice curative process, um, but it's gonna be a palliative intent in most other cases when wide excision isn't possible. Surgical margins, um, sorry, the wide margins, that's my most commonly used uh, type of surgical margin. You remove enough tissue in the normal tissue margins where excised specimen sits nice and centered uh, within in, in the three dimensions. So you, it's not about just thinking about your lateral margins, you also have to think about your deep margins. A lot of the tumors, lateral margins, uh, oops, sorry. Um, lateral margins, you know, your one centimeter depends on your low-grade soft tissue sarcomas or mast cell tumors. Five centimeters, which I have never done, are uh, with injection site sarcomas because I don't see it in Australia. We don't have rabies here, but it's probably something that you do see in Sri Lanka. Um, injection site sarcomas where you have to take nearly five centimeters. So literally, you know, five centimeters on each side. So 10 centimeters of skin subcut, sometimes bone etc. from cats. This is the reason why you should do your previous vaccination on legs rather than between the shoulder blades. Deep margins where you, a lot of the times, nearly 95% of my cases where I do go um, one fascial layer deeper. So if it's on the skin, I go down to the level of the subcut. If it's subcut and skin, I go remove a part of the muscle. Um, you can see this is what your primary tumor looks like within your nice pseudocapsule but these little tendrils of octopus um, legs are what we call as satelliting. Um, that's where if you do a marginal excision, where you end up leaving a lot of those satellite regions there. And when you do a wide marginal, wide, um, marginal excision, or a wide margin excision is a better word, uh, where you end up taking this entire tumor out. Um, this is another image. So you have your tumor, this is your nice reactive region. 
marginal excision basically takes only what's encapsulated. It doesn't take this reactive satellite ruins. But when you do a wide excision, you end up taking the entire reactive region and the two marbles. So if you are going with a curative intent, always think about wide excisions. Um, radical excisions where, you know, it, it literally relates to your splenectomies, where if you notice the nodule or hematosarcoma, you take the entire spleen out. When you have your, uh, when you do a complete leg amputation, when you have your osteosarcoma, and the other one commonly is your mammary strips as well. Um, all right, so I thought we'll get some cases again, similar to last time. So Baxter was uh, a 10 year old female short, uh, sorry, female spade Labrador retriever presented with a mass on the caudal um, left shoulder, as, as you can see on the image. Um, exam, all the vitals were normal. It was a large size of a nice big grapefruit, soft mass just under the skin. Um, what would I do as a next step is to do a nice fine needle aspirate. And this is what I got, which looks like a nice fatty, you know, a light coma. Um, is there a need for grading or staging? Um, I, I commonly get what if it's a, lymph, uh, a liposarcoma. Chances are it is not. I've never seen a liposarcoma, but you know, it's, it's never a bad idea to send it for a grade if you want to be pedantic. But in this case, uh, I didn't think it looked like a liposarcoma. It looked quite benign in my eyes and my surgical intent basically being curative. Procedure, I did end up going with a marginal excision, but as you can see with the image below above rather, it was a big chunk. So I did end up taking a nice three centimeter chunk of skin out to get a good uh, fascial closure and more of a cosmetic closure. Um, this is not the same lump that I removed, but this is what basically your lipoma looks like with your nice um, pseudocapsule surrounding it. And if, again, you know, if you do accidentally cut into a lipoma and leave some cells behind, the tumor can come up again. Um, Charlie was the second case that I had. Uh, it was 11 year old male neutered staph, uh, bull terrier cross. I know that it's, it's quite commonly breed in Sri Lanka now. So um, this is one of those cases to remember. Um, it presented with a mass on the left lateral thigh, was on the chubbier side of things. Uh, vitals were normal. The soft tissue mass was under the skin, uh, quite mobile and easily movable. Um, mass was initially diagnosed as a lipoma by an FNA a few months ago. It was slowly getting bigger and I'm causing a little bit of discomfort to the patient and the owner presented again. And then we ended up doing a second fine needle aspirate. And this is what we got, which was you know a mast cell tumor. Um, so if you can remember from the previous slide that I told you about the mast cell research, you can end up accidentally aspirating fat surrounding a, a tumor. So if your tumor is getting bigger, do not go with your previous diagnosis. Always do a second fine needle aspirate. You'll be quite surprised what you find. Um, diagnosing, diagnosis being a muscle tumor. Um, next steps. Um, I'm happy for people to answer if they would like to. Um, so basically, you've got your five options. Um, I've decided, you know, you can do biopsy and grading. You can do your local lymph node aspirates as an option that will help with your staging. Abdominal ultrasound again with your staging. Thoracic x-rays, I'll put a question mark and I'll explain to you why. And bone marrow aspirates, question mark, just because Going to the biopsy, I did do a biopsy. It ended up becoming a low-grade mast cell tumor, uh, thankfully. Local lymph nodes, I did not aspirate. That was my mistake because I was a new to surgical oncology. I should have done it, despite being a low-grade mast cell tumor. Abdominal ultrasound, I did not find any gross pathology, so I did not go ahead with any further investigation. Thoracic x-ray is not done. Basically, number one, location. Cutaneous mast cell tumors rarely ever metastasize to the lungs. So if people are wasting money doing thoracic x-rays, that's something to remember about with your future mast cell tumors. But there is exceptions, and I'll show you an example of why I say there is an exception. But there's never not a reason to do thoracic x-rays. So I'm not saying don't do it, but be, you know, be able to explain why you do it. Um, the surgical outcome, I took two centimeter white margins and one of fascial layer deep. Histopat came as a complete excision with white margin circumferential with one fascial layer deeper. So the perfect answer that you want to look for. 
Um, there is a common discussion that's going on in the veterinary field, and I see this question popping up a lot. Should we biopsy a mast cell tumor at all? Because the biggest risk with doing a biopsy is that you can, number one, aggravate the tissue from getting bigger. Um, you can spread the tumor into the local perfectly, you know, benign areas. And then you can also create or risk the patient going into an anaphylaxic shock because all these mast cell tumors are filled with heparin, they're filled with histamines, and then you can create easily push them towards a big anaphylactic shock. So that is something to remember when you, it's not a risk with fine needle aspirates, but it is a risk with when you're doing biopsies. Um, oops. Um, low grade mast cell tumors, grade one to two, um, surgery alone may be curative in majority of the cases and your wide margin excision. So grade one, one centimeter, grade two, two centimeters, it's easy to remember. Um, and uh, for grade three tumors where it's a high grade tumor, you do need wide margins, three centimeter plus in lo a lot of occasions and sometimes radical resection depending on you know, your site of the leg, et cetera, or spleen, you need a splenectomy. The one year survival rate, something to remember with surgery alone is only about 20%. Surgery and chemotherapy is about 50%. Two year survival rate with surgery alone is all zero. Two year survival with surgery and chemotherapy, I think at the top of my head was about 5%. So, you know, something to remember, if you do have a big, unhappy muscle tumor, this is one of those things to discuss with the owners. Um, should I biopsy before excision? Questions to ask yourself and the owner. Can you get three centimeter wide margins? And can you go one fascia layer deeper? Is the owner going to be happy with the survival rates with surgery alone? Remember, again, 20% survival at the end of the one year. Can the owners manage the cytotoxic patient if they do, do decide to go ahead with chemotherapy? You know, it can be quite expensive in Australia. Um, one of these patients can cost nearly up to about $10,000 in Sri Lanka in terms of about 1.3 million um, for just, you know, 50% chance of one year survival. Then you have to think about your children's safety. You have to think about the pregnant family members where cytotoxic excretory products are going to be coming in contact and that's not going to be a good idea. Um, this is a case that I had um, actually last week. I saw the patient today for its revisit. Uh, it was a mid-10-year-old male muted Labrador retriever. There was a mass over the dorsal thorax that was aspirated at their regular vet that's gone, grown rapidly. And that mass at the time was um, diagnosed as a mast cell tumor. They didn't do anything about it, which was a big no-no in my books. And they presented as a surgical uh, second opinion, um, surgical consultation to one of the other vets in my practice. Um, and the owners also noted a smaller second mass on the ventral chest that came up recently. And my colleague did not examine, which I've highlighted being a big problem. Um, the good that this colleague did, uh, they discussed with the owners about the need for wide margin surgical resections. They discussed about, you know, possibly going through staging, possibly going through biopsying, et cetera, prior to surgery, which was fantastic. The bad was that she did not re-FNA the mass to confirm that it was a fine needle aspirate before booking it for surgery. She did not pay attention to that ventral mass as well, which I think is a bad thing. The dorsal mass ended up confirming that it was a mast cell tumor. As you can see these nice pictures that I've taken. And this was the ventral mass again, which was a completely, you know, uh, another muscle tumor. One question that we have to ask is, is the second mass linked to the first mass? And with muscle tumors, they do not behave that way. The typical part of a, mass, a metastatic muscle tumor is through the regional lymph nodes to distant sites of the spleen, liver, or the bone marrow. Multiple cutaneous mast cell can occur at the same time and they can all be primary and they can also have their different grades. So the first tumor could be a benign, or sorry, a low grade mast cell tumor. And the second one could be a very nasty high grade mast cell tumor. So if you do have a number of different, different mast cells, and if you wanna do biopsies to know what the grades are, you have to do with each and every one of them. If you do FNAs, you do have to send the FNAs out with each and every one of them. Um, is thoracic x-rays indicated in this patient? Again, there was one on the dorsal thorax, there's one on the ventral thorax. Is there anyone willing to answer that question as to why x-rays was a good idea in this patient? 
anyone. No. So it's, it's a lot to do with the location and how the, um, metast the, the process of metastases goes. I'd said maybe, and why? Because the like regional lymph node pathway is through the thoracic lymph nodes. So you wanna do your chest x-rays, not to look at the lungs, but to actually look at your mediastinal lymph nodes. Um, in this case, did I do it? No, the owners refused me going ahead. They wanted wide margin resections. They were happy with the surgical uh, margin, sorry, the, the survival rate of 20%. Um, so this was my patient preparation. I always um, uh, draw my tumor margins. We can get these sterile marker pens. So this is my tumor but then you can see my three centimeter margin that I've drawn. I've extended the margins because I wanna get a nice cosmetic closure and I don't want dog ears, skin tags coming up. And this was my, sorry, this was my ventral mass and this was my dorsal mass where I've taken, you can slightly bigger mass. I've drawn out a nice oval shape. Um, so this is what you're gonna end up with once you've done a proper a proper cut through. I've cut through the skin, I've cut through the subcut subcutaneous tissue in 360 degrees, and I've gone one fascia a little deeper up to the muscle layers. So this is your pectoral muscles that's showing up there. Um, I was able to get primary closure on it because you've got nice mobile skin, then I've got nice, you know, you can see the skin's nice and aligned in a nice straight line. Um, so this is the result that I actually got a little while ago. Um, we can see the tumor within its pseudocapsule. But if you look closely, you can see that the pseudocapsules um, actually broken up, satelliting inwards. And this is my nice normal tissue margin that I've taken. And I've actually managed to take a part of this cutaneous trunk eye muscle at the bottom as well, which I've taken good margins of. Oops. Um, and this is of the ventral mass. Uh, if you can see, you can see this escape cells going on. Um, you can see that I've taken um, sorry about that, a nice chunk of fat rounding and then the skin margin here. So this is where taking tissues is important. Um, and you can see this nice chunk of muscle tumors. I'm lucky again, when I send it to the IDEX labs, they send me these nice, beautiful pictures to review. Um, this was another case that I had probably about six months ago, which was a very um, annoying case for me. Uh, it was um, a 12 year old man muted um, English taffy. Um, there was a full mass under the skin at the right carpus, as you can see on the image here. It was not easily movable. So if you can't easily move it, one thing that you remember is that there is gonna be inner attachment. So you have to think about your deep margins a little bit more closely. Um, I did an FNA, oh, sorry, my colleague did an FNA. And if, uh, in, in, in the clinic, it was inconclusive. All I saw was neutrophils, macrophages, mixture of spindle shaped cells, fat cells. So it wasn't a proper diagnosis. And when we sent to the lab, interestingly, they came up with something called an epithelial tumor, which I wasn't too um, happy with. I, you know, this is another reason why you have to remember FNAs are not always diagnostic. So we ended up doing a punch biopsy for sampling um, and ended up coming confirming as a low grade soft tissue sarcoma. It's biochemistry, it's full blood count, um, urinalysis all within normal limits. So we ended up deciding to go ahead with a curative intent. Soft tissue, um, so low grade soft tissue sarcoma is where it can be quite curative if you do a good surgery. We decided to go with two centimeter wide marginal resections and a deep resection down to the flexor tendons. I sadly don't have a picture of this, but there is another interesting uh, picture where you'll see these tendons. The good thing about the location is over the flexor tendons, you get this nice thick sheet that is um, resistant to most tumor penetration. So if you take that sheet off with your um, mass resection, you can be guaranteed a lot of the cases that you do do a good removal. Wound closure is a tricky region. If anyone's done surgery in that area, knows that wound closure is a big risk. If you, when you take two centimeter margins around it, uh, already a big tumor, you're looking at about eight centimeters of skin loss. And if you try to close that, that's gonna cause a tourniquet effect and gonna have um, digital necrosis, etc. 
So I decided to leave it to heal by second intention. And then we managed the wound with a nice soft padded bandage uh, with a splint and, and non-adherent wound contact there. So that's something to remember, use your medallin, etc. cetera. Um, the histopath came up being a complete mass excision with nice wide margins. Um, soft tissue sarcomas. Low-grade soft tissue sarcomas has a 5% local recurrence rate within five years, which is almost, you know, close to zero. It's, it's basically, you don't have to worry about it if you do a good job. Um, chemotherapy does not help reduce the rate of metastasis. So there is no indication for chemotherapy in these low-grade soft tissue sarcomas. If surgery is not an option for owners, if it's a very old uh, patient, metronomic chemotherapy, which I'll explain soon, can help full in slowing down local spread. Metronomic chemotherapy is, is where you are worried to, uh, you use it if you're worried to remove it or if you're worried about incomplete excision with soft tissue sarcomas. Um, another thing to remember is even if you do uh, an incomplete excision, your chances are it's only going to be about somewhere between 30 to 80% at the end of five years. So if it's an real patient, you don't have to stress too much. Um, it helps to reduce down um, the, the um, recurrence rates down to about 20% um, at the level at the age of uh, at five years from surgery from about 30 to 80%, which is good. But then, you know, metronomic chemotherapy is for life. Um, it's, we use pyroxicam and cyclophosphamide. Um, you cannot sadly replace peroxicam with meloxicam. I actually do not know why, but you can't. Um, and then it cumulatively can be quite expensive over time. I find peroxicam and cyclophosphamide monthly costing my patients somewhere between eight to hundred dollars a month, which in Sri Lankan terms is about 10,000 to 15,000 rupees a month, which is quite expensive. Um, a big side effect um, with especially using cyclophosphamide is hemorrhagic, hemorrhagic cystitis. But the good thing is if you stop cyclophosphamide for a while, especially changing it to 40 double frequencies can be reversible. Um, so this was the patient three weeks after surgery, the big wound deficit filled with nice granulation bed. Um, there is actually a little bit of prout fleshing going on. I tried to trim it a few times, but at three months after surgery, it was still an annoying wound that I had. And you can see the last wound, uh, it, you know, it's still proud fleshing over or exuberant granulation is the correct word for it. Um, this was annoying me. So I did, this, I modified my plan. I epithelialization had decided to cease and stop. It wasn't progressing any further. So we decided in favor of the skin, sorry, this has to be skin graft, where I've taken a part of the skin from the base of the ventral neck, um, thinned it out. I'll show you more pictures of how I did it. And then it, we had a little bit of edge necrosis, which was completely expected. And then a one month later, it's completely healed with this nice layer of thin epithelium. So this is one of those options where if you have chronic wounds that you can't deal with, number one, suspect a tumor, number two, if it's not a tumor, you can do skin grass quite easily. You don't need special equipment. It's actually quite easy. Um, Molly was another case that I had. It was a nine-year-old female spade American staffy. Um, there was a large 10 centimeter by five centimeter firm mass that um, came up on the left flank. Owners noticed the, this mass when they were bathing the dogs. So it was nice and hiding under the skin and the fat until the owners felt this. Um, they do know that they do play rough with the other dog, eating and drinking fine. Um, it was not easily movable, so you have to worry about abdominal wall muscle attachments in these cases. All of the vitals are normal and there were no local lymph, node enlarged, uh, lymph nodes that were enlarged. Um, diagnosis, I didn't find, oh, sorry, another vet to the final aspirate and her basically I quoted this from her, her notes where she briefly mentioned all greasy looking blood. Possible differentials, what's happening? Anyone wanna try at a guess of what's going on or what possibilities? The owners reckon it wasn't there before. It suddenly came up. No, <laughs> that's okay. Um, so one of the things that I would worry about is a hematoma or an abscess, because if it's, it's, it's not, it wasn't there before, it suddenly came up. So that's one of those things that you want to worry about with these. Um, but interestingly, I decided to go with the biopsy, um, just because the final aspirate was not up to, you know, what I expected. 
I did an institutional wedge biopsy and the biopsy result, this was the biopsy sample um, that I got and it ended up becoming a, a subcutaneous hemangiosarcoma, which I've never come across before. I've seen skin cutaneous ones, subcutaneous ones, I've never come across before this one. Um, tumor staging, I decided to do chest radiographs because hemangiosarcoma is like your um, chest. Um, I did not see any of these signs of metastases. So a lot of the times if you do chest radiographs with hemangiosarcomas, they have to be in at least five to seven millimeters before you can start noticing them. CT scans have a better um, degree of diagnosis where they can diagnose any mass over two millimeters. They decline the referral. I did do an abdominal ultrasound. I did notice some slight changes, which freaked me out a little bit. I did, uh, the, what I noticed was a mixed sectionic mass and splenic tail. You know, you do worry about hemangiosarcoma when you see these mixed sectionic masses. Local lymph nodes, superficial inguinal lymph node and the medial iliac lymph nodes were not palpable or enlarged to be easily sampled. Um, so I discussed the likelihood that there would be a metastasis to the spleen. And I had the luxury of discussing with the specialist. He recommended I take a two centimeter wide margins with removal of parts of the external, external abdominal oblique muscle. I've seen specialists remove masses, masses where it's between muscles. They go remove all three layers of muscle and you'll be quite surprised. Where did you get the tissue to tissue transplant? Is it from the, um, the previous case? Uh, yes, uh, look, uh, yes, look, um, so you, yeah, yes, in the session, right? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm, I can happy to answer it now, I can do it afterwards if you like. Okay, okay, okay. yeah, you can answer. so after, it's okay, yeah, all right. Um, so, owner's discussion, um, I usually like doing two step procedures with these cases because one of the steps is to go into the abdomen and take the spleen out. And the next step was to remove the mass, um, but the owners didn't want to do surgeries given the age. And just in case, because it was a splenic tumor, I had two, I had blood grouped it. It was a DEA one minus, I think, if I could remember. And I had two packs of blood ready for transfusion if I needed to. Um, these are instruments that I have the luxury for. And I think everyone who wants to do oncology surgery should have. Um, this one is an electrocautery. I'm sure people would have seen, I know, a, 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 a clinic uh, in Pera that you had it. This one's what we call a vessel sealing device. Um, it's a luxury that I have um, where I can go through vessels and I don't have to worry about ligating, splenic vessels, etc. I just have to hold it for five seconds for each vessel and this cuts through it and then removes the entire spleen. I do splenectomies in under um, 20 to 30 minutes because of this. Um, so uh, we decided to do with an X-lap and splenectomy as our first step. And then the mass with wide margin resection where I ended up taking nearly 50% of the external abdominal oblique muscle with me. So total surgery time was only about one or 10 minutes. Total surgery cost to the owners was about $3,500 plus histopat charges. Um, to put it into context, this is about 500,000 rupees in Sri Lankan terms. Um, so the inguinal masses, again, confirmed as a hemangiosarcoma, excisional margins were complete. The spleen, thankfully, wasn't a hemangiosarcoma. It was a nice parenchymal hemorrhage that happens with, you know, incidental findings. Um, and it says inguinal mass is completely exercised. However, the margins are extremely narrow. It was only about one millimeter despite me taking two centimeter margins. So this is where, you know, wanting to take um, wide margins is important. I spoke to the owners, discussed about going in for a second surgery to take wider margins, but they wanted to monitor, which was fine. At the six month recheck, there was no signs of local disease as of yet. Um, when it comes to cancer surgery, there is two components. Number one, that you have to focus on is the resection side of things and then you have to worry about reconstruction. In human world, you have your oncology surgeons that does the resection, and then in reconstruction, you, you have your plastic surgeons. But in the veterinary field, we are unlucky, we have to do both together. So this is where planning your surgical approach, planning your margins, planning your closure is very important. Um, so surgical plan must also include your plants at wound closure. Cats, you're lucky, you, they usually have very mobile skin, 
and subcutaneous tissue that will be in your favor. And you can always use um, second intention healing, like a normal wound closure in your favor. You're not too worried about cosmetics like in people. You can allow, you know, a big scar tissue to be and your dog would be happy as usual. If the owners had a big wound removal and a scar tissue forming, they'll be quite sad. Um, there is plenty of ways to help your wound closures and there is um, what we call as tension relieving techniques. Um, there is an entire chapter um, in Tobias and Johnston on tension relieving techniques for anyone who is interested in the new books, it's chapter 77. Um, out of which I use these highlighted ones most commonly, and tissue undermining, subcutaneous undermining, strong subcutaneous sutures where I use up to, you know, two zero up to one PDS sutures, walking sutures where I'll show you pictures of what I mean, and relaxing incisions and grafting and flaps. So this is tissue undermining. Um, you, you know, use a pair of gen dental tissue forceps or medicine balms, use, uh, you know, mixture of blunt and sharp dissection to go under the skin. These are your cutaneous vessels that you want to try and preserve because they bring in a big, good chunk of blood supply to your subcut and the skin. So try to preserve them as much as possible and make sure um, you stick to the Halstead principles where you prevent, you maintain your blood supply, you minimize hemorrhages. That's where having electrocautery and vessel sealing devices are quite important. Strong subcutaneous stitches where you have this nice, you know, subcut tissue you can bring quite close together. When you do wound closures, try to make sure that you don't have tension on the skin and skin's not an area of tension bearing. That's the most important thing and it's a common mistake that people do. And I've seen images where uh, people have posted online. You can, I can see the skin uh, poking, poking up um, where they've just basically done um, this, you know, interrupted sutures. So that basically, every time I look at it, I, I cringe because I notice that people have put their sutures quite tight, which your skin has to always be an appositional layer. It's not a, a tension bearing layer. And that's why I don't like a lot of the other ones that I'm going to explain. Um, strong subcutaneous sutures is where that's what I showed you. This is what's called as the bolster technique, where you, you know, you try to get your closure with um, normal um, sutures, like in cruciate pattern or in mattress patterns. And then you use thick um, sutures and, and a rolled up gauze um, to relieve that tension away from. But as you can see on this image, again, the tension's not on the skin, the tension's through skin, subcut, muscle layers, all that. So that's another thing to remember. Um, so this is stent technique, which I really don't like using, but I put an image where it's an option. Um, tension relieving techniques where far near near far sutures or far far near near sutures. So far near near far basically means far far near near, and then you have your far near near far. Again, as you can see, it's not something that goes through the skin alone. It goes through your skin subcut, etc. I only use this when I do tendon closures. I don't use it on skin. I try to avoid them as much as possible, but those are options. Um, these are what we call as walking sutures. So basically you use a suture to go through not just the subcut tissue, but also through the dermal tissue and then attach it. So, you know, you basically say you have about two centimeters here and you have about three centimeters here. You pull it far enough so that it, it stretches out over um, into helping you close the suture. Again, something that I do use rarely, but not commonly. Um, it's, it's appropriate in dogs with thicker dermis, um, but not so much in cats and thin skin dogs. Um, this is a vacuum uh, negative pressure wound therapy. I do not have access to this, but I know specialists who do. Um, this helps with multiple different things. It helps bring the wound closer together. It helps with stimulating wound healing, etc. There's quite a lot of benefits with these vacuum assisted closures. Um, this is one technique that I do use commonly. Um, not a lot with tumor removals, but with a lot of other types of wounds like dog fight wound closures, etc. Um, the whole point of this is to make one centimeter, I call it my one centimeter rule. Um, basically what you do is, sorry, one centimeter away from the incision, one centimeter stabs, and one centimeter between 
um, your incisions and you want to have alternatives. You want to have, you don't want to have one here and one there, because if you do have a cutaneous vessel coming in, you don't want to accidentally damage it. So you want to have nice, you know, collateral circulation going through. So basically you can use like a 15 or 11 blade to make these type of incisions. You not just go through skin, you go through skin subcut as well. So you can see the subcut lay in there. Um, so this is coming back to the diesels case, Dr. Sugatal has our answer. So basically I've got this little skin area. What I do is I template. I use like a gauze swab over the wound. I pad it a little bit and then go to my, um, my donor site, which in this case, I like my ventral or lateral chest, but in this dog, there was, it was a chubby side. So I couldn't um, risk the tension. So I got it from the ventral neck. So when you get it from the ventral neck, you have a lot of this subcutaneous tissue. Basically you get this nice sterile um, kidney dish use blade to, you know, pull, uh, literally get rid of all that fat until you get this see-through layer of skin. You should be able to see through down to the, um, your kidney dish at the bottom. And, you know, if you're making incisions into the skin, don't worry, that's what you want. Um, and that's when I have put in multiple sutures to hold it in place. So this is one of those techniques that anyone can do easily. And this was one of the first ones that I did. So I was quite paranoid doing it, but you know, it's something that you can easily do. Um, tension relieving flaps, I have started to do them um, as of like probably in the last 12 to um, 16 months quite um, commonly. You do have these cutaneous vessels, which people don't have quite commonly, but dogs are lucky where you can have multiple you can cut out a nice chunk of skin, rotate it with the vessel. They have, um, this is an age is from um, Johnson and Tobias as well. Um, you do, I think you do get it on the fossum. Um, so you can use multiple different ones. Um, one case that I had, um, sadly this dog had to be put to sleep a few months after due to bad arthritis, but um, this was a case, a low grade soft tissue sarcoma on the lateral hock. Um, and if you can see on that other image, what you see is, as, um, oh, it's actually not here, sorry. So you do have your medial saphenous vein. I used what we call as a conduit flap. Uh, so what I've basically done is, sorry, let's close this window real quickly. Uh, so this is me taking my um, flap. And if you look closely where my cursor goes, if that's your medial saphenous vein that I've um, kept intact in this. Um, I've pre-measured what my mass is going to be so I can take margins out. And this is me going down all the way to the bone and that's the calcaneus tendon. That's the tumor attached at its bases. Um, and that's what it looked like. So that's your, you know, your uh, calcaneus tendon and it's gone all the way down to the sh sheath. So I've taken off the sheath with my tumor. Um, and this is my donor site where I have close to primarily and I have put some tension relieving incisions like I showed you. So one centimeter from the wound site, one centimeter between each side. Um, and this, what was the final flap closure look like? The reason why I decided for a flap in this case is uh, over a, where, where the tendon was, there is a lot of motion. So a lot of motion doesn't help with um, second intention healing as much. So that's why I've decided on a primary closure. Um, this was, I did have a degree of edge necrosis, which you do expect in nearly 15 to 25% of your flap cases. But this is what, you know, the rest of it healed nicely by second intention. Hair is not going to grow. One thing that you have to notice when you do flaps, you have to warn them about the cosmetic effect. You can see that the hair is not in the same manner. You can see a little bit of scar tissue, but the dog was happy and walking. Um, this is coming more towards the end of the, uh, the discussion where I want to talk specifically about certain tumors. So the bleeding splenic mass is mostly common seen in older large breed dogs are at a higher risk, especially at the age of eight to 10 years. If you have a dog in shock with a pendulous fluid filled abdomen, you'll be worried about the bleeding splenic mass. Most common tumor is hemangiosarcomas. They're quite highly malignant in a lot of the cases, um, they like metastasizing to the liver, the lungs, and the, the atrium of the heart. So if I do get a patient, I always look at um, ultrasound my liver completely. I ultrasound, I x-ray my lungs to see if there's any metastases. And I do do a quick echo, echo to see um, if there is any masses on the atrium. 
Um, I, I know I have actually posted a picture on the SCAP discussion group once where this was one of the cases. Um, common presentation is the hemo abdomen where the dog was fine, he was running around and suddenly, um, if you're doing full blood counts and if you're looking at smears, I know Sri Lankans do look at smears a lot more than I do because of tick fever, but if you do notice acanthocytes quite commonly in your slide, always suspect a splenic mass. Um, I've, there's been a fair few times, I can count on my fingers, where I've seen acanthocytes on a smear where someone else asked me and I've ultrasounded the abdomen and found a splenic mass. So, you know, it's one of those things that you want to teach vet students, you want to teach yourself to do is if you do notice abnormal cells that are ruptured, um, I suspect a splenic mass. Because uh, you can be, you know, it could be the factor that saves the patient's life. Um, the other reason where tumors get diagnosed is incidental findings on abdominal ultrasounds. Um, you can fine needle aspirate them with a very fine needle over a biopsy, but with whatever you do, always be ready for an emergency X lab because you can make them bleed. Um, if you do notice, this, you know, a part of the staging is your full blood count, biochemistry, thoracic radiographs, abdominal ultrasounds to look at. Um, you know, what the tumor looks like, the location, um, et cetera, and echocardiogram. There is a high probability that concurrent splenic and atrial masses occur at the same time. And I only see three, this in one of three of my, one in three of my cases, which is a pretty significant, um, significant percentage of cases. So, you know, if you just see a splenic mass, just don't go rush into a, uh, 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 he, what do you call it, X-Lab, always try to look at an echo and then look at the atria. Uh, total splenectomy or radical splenectomy is the treatment of choice for all suspected splenic neoplasms or masses. Dogs are lucky compared to humans. You do not leave um, splenic parts of spleen behind. I have seen it a few times. Do not do partial splenectomies. Um, I consider that medical negligence if you do. Um, so remember something to do with basic anatomy. Um, you have your main aorta, which divides into your celiac artery, has three branches. Um, one of the main branches is your splenic artery. Um, when I'm lucky with my life issues, I go just basically cauterize, 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 cauterize along that splenic hyalus and remove the entire spleen. Um, you can sacrifice your short gastric arteries that supplies to the left side of your um, the stomach. Uh, and one of the things that you have to be careful is splenic arteries do supply um, to your left side of the pancreas. So you can end up with pancreatic necrosis if you're not careful. So try to go close to the spleen as possible when you do your splenectomies. Um, complications, post-surgery hemorrhage, a lot of the times is because of poor surgical technique. Thankfully, I've never had um, that happen to me. Um, again, I've got the luxury of Ligasure. DIC is a very common process that can happen. So most post-operative deaths are because of DIC. I've had probably two patients die and the diagnosis um, that you know it's DIC, it's thrombocytopenia, ongoing with increase uh, uh, PT and APTT times. Um, ischemic necrosis of the pancreas, like I've explained before, is a common, uh, not a common one, but it's one of those things that people want to be careful about. Cardiac arrhythmias is very common. It happens in 50% of the patients. And um, there is new evidence to say that 90% of the malignant tumors will lead to arrhythmias. So uh, once they've already metastasized, and if you notice cardiac arrhythmias, that's one of those cases. So I, I'm, I do sometimes have them continuously on ECG being monitored. I don't have the luxury of someone looking at the ECG monitor all the time, but it's one of those things that I would like to be able to monitor for the 24 to 48 hours after surgery. I think it's something that we can train students to do in the ICUs at the uh, at Pear Avenue and stuff like that as well. Um, and it's one of the most common post-op complications that is easily missed. One of the things that we do is I use lignocaine um, CRIs um, as a part of my surgical pain control, uh, which is the kind of the treatment of size, tre treatment of choice with the cardiac arrhythmia that you see, which are commonly uh, ventricular premature complexes. Um, there's what we call the two-thirds rule. Um, 
when it comes to splenic masses, two thirds of all splenic masses are malignant. And out of that two thirds, another two thirds end up being hemangiosarcoma. So basically, you know, two thirds times two thirds is roughly about six of nines. That's for approximately 50% of all splenic masses end up becoming hemangiosarcomas. Bigger the splenic mass, it's usually better prognosis. Why is that? Because hemangiosarcomas, if anyone who's handled hemangiosarcomas know, are easily friable. They literally melt in your fingers. So if a splenic mass can end up becoming bigger without rupturing, they usually, not, not saying it's not a hemangiosarcoma, but they tend to have better prognosis because they, they have much better um, strength in the splenic tumor tissue. Um, this is basically, you know, the different types of splenic tumors that can occur in the other types of splenic tumors that can occur in, uh, compared to um, hemangiosarcomas. One of the common ones that I've seen are mast cell tumors um, and malignant histiocytomas. Um, lymphoma I've seen probably in a cat ones, I think. Um, but other than that, I don't think I've seen the other one. So I'm just gonna have a quick water break. Um, all right, osteosarcomas in dogs, another common tumor that I used to see when I was back in Sri Lanka, another common one that I see here in Australia. Um, your most common locations, um, one of the things to remember is it's usually away from the elbow. So it happens on your um, proximal humerus, distal radial ulna, and towards the knee. So your distal femur and proximal tibia is a common location but it can literally occur in any bones, um, commonly on your ribs. It can happen on your dorsal, um, uh, the uh, scapula, sorry. Uh, it can happen in your pelvic bones, proximal um, femur. It can happen in your distal uh, tibia fibula and anywhere on the skull, commonly the mandible as well. I have taken a mandible. I've done a partial mandibular to mean a dog had, had a mandible tumor. Um, this is what it looks like. It comes as a big nodule. It can present as a, a pathological fracture, which I have seen. I'm sure everybody's seen that. So if you notice a sudden fracture while a dog was running in an older dog, always do worry about um, osteosarcomas. So on the x-rays, you can make a presumptive diagnosis basically based on breed, age, location and radiographs alone. It is another large dog problem that we see. Um, you can do fine needle aspirate. Uh, this is me trying to take a sample out. Um, cytological criteria has been explained. So cytological criteria doesn't mean that they see osteosarcomas on the FNA, but they do see certain other changes. So if you do have someone who um, is pretty good at diagnosing I, I know Dr. Harsha is fantastic at, at the pair of the new university. So, you know, it's one of those research that um, is advisable looking at if, if people are interested in, but you know, a lot of the times if I do see this, I know it's an osteosarcoma, it's almost unlikely something else. Um, there is biopsy techniques as well. Um, you can do an incisional biopsies, be careful that you can fracture the bone. You can do close needle biopsies and then I have what we call the trepine biopsy, which is like a saw tooth um, or a round um, little block that goes in and takes samples. Um, two concerns that you have to want to be looking for is your primary tumor and then your secondary metastases, which happens in 90% of your cases. As, as a rule of thumb, all dogs with osteosarcomas are going to die because of their tumor and because they're likely secondary spread. I've never seen a patient who has not had secondary tumor spread, who hasn't um, come to be euthanized later on because of their secondary spread. Um, one thing to remember is one of the most common areas that it does go is into the lungs. Um, and another common thing to remember is that it can occur in other bones concurrently. So if you do see an osteosarcoma in one limb, do full body x-rays, do the skull, do your chest, do your spine and all the bones, um, because there is a chance that you might notice an osteosarcoma in other bones. Clinical prognosis the Worse the prognosis? Um, it's opposite to your spleen and location. Um, proximal humerus has usually a much worse prognosis. 
mandible metatarsals and your metacarpal rhizomes usually have favorable prognosis. Um, one of the things to do with your cases is look at your ALP values. Um, you can't necessarily do a bone ALP, it's not a thing that is easily available. But if you have a patient who's not on steroids, who doesn't look like a Cushing's disease, Cushing's disease is more commonly a small dog thing. So if you have a large breakdown, Cushing's disease is not as common. If you have increased ALP, they usually almost always have a very, very bad prognosis. So that's one of those things that's important to remember. Um, treatment of the primary tumor. You can do medical management, basically pain relief. Your media, MSD basically means media survival time is about one to three months. I almost see it's about, only about one month and cause of death in my experience is euthanasia. Um, I'm not sure how that is, it relates to Sri Lankan vets, but yeah. Um, amputation alone, medial survival time is only about five to six months. So that's one of those things we wanna discuss with owners, but I've seen as low as three months. Um, oops. Amputation and chemotherapy uh, can go up to about 10 to 12 months. You can do palliative radiations, um, which is not a common thing that's available even in Australia. Um, it's weekly, four doses, median survival time is about four months, and it's quite expensive. You're looking at about two to $3,000 at the top of my head for all four doses. Limb salvage surgery, which I'll show you pictures of, and limb salvage and chemotherapy, again, you can have about 10 to 12 months. Again, 10 to 12 months doesn't sound like a lot of time for us. But for someone who's been a big part of your family, 10 to 12 months could be a long time. So, you know, there is amputation and chemotherapy options. Even six months to me is a decent time to, you know, say goodbye to your patient. And I've done amputations in dogs who are more than 50 to 60 kilos. So just because a dog's big doesn't mean amputation isn't an option. If they're not, if they're mobile on four legs without very bad arthritis, you can do amputation on any dog. Um, secondary metastasis, lungs occur 60% of the time. Always do three V radiographs, just don't do your two. I actually make mine four V radiographs. I do left lateral, right lateral, DV and VD, um, and other bones does occur 40% of the time. So doing x-rays of the full body is important. Chemotherapy helps double to triple survival times, which is something important to remember. And this is usually after primary tumor has been addressed. Carboplatin and um, adriamycin is your most common ones. Um, but again, I don't get a lot of people using it just because of the risks and the expense of it. Um, and honestly, six months is a good time to say goodbye, in my opinion. Uh, this is a limb salvage surgery, which was um, invented by uh, one of the vets that I have good communications with, Dr. Charles from South Paws. So this is one of those images where they've actually used a bone, what I call a bone allograft. So this, he had, they used to have a bone bank. So when, they, when a dog dies, they preserve the bones and then you use it as an allograft, which I think is a pretty fancy surgery. But again, something to remember is this is one of those procedures that is not easy to do. It is not a procedure that has uh, that you know increases your survival time if you don't do chemotherapy. And it is a very, very expensive procedure. And this is more suited for very, very big dogs. Um, and this is what it looks like. So this is your allograft in there. It has a big, thick plate. And they do um, like an arthro disease, which I think is pretty cool. But I don't know whether I would be recommending to my patients. But it is always an option. So someone interesting in Sri Lanka, you can start keeping allografts, etc. cetera. Um, this is kind of the ending slide for me. So when you have a mass detected, always go into your fine middle aspirates or biopsies. Um, and when that's, once you have your answer, go into doing staging. If they are low grade, you don't have to worry about staging in most circumstances and most common tumors, but staging is never a bad option. So you have staging that is focused on your local region and then your systemic regions. Local regional, you can do with your physical exam, imaging like CT, MRI, X-rays and then through lymph node evaluation locally. Your systemic ones usually include your blood work, again, imaging your chest, abdomen with ultrasound, CT, radiographs, etc. Do you see abnormalities? What are you going to do? Can you do a definitive treatment or does it need further investigation? And if you think it needs definitive treatment, what's your treatment going to be? Think about your surgical margins, think about your flat closures and what you can do with regards to skin. And then 
you know. Closing note, most mistakes in cancer surgery are made not because of, uh, sorry, because of not resecting aggressively enough and not because of not knowing what the diagnosis is. So if you remember my mast cell tumor that I did last week, you know, I didn't know what the grade was. I went quite aggressively. And I know that I have good margins. Yes, that's the end of my presentation. I'll be more than happy to answer questions. Yes, Dr. Sandra, it's a very nice presentation. Thank you. Uh, shall I give the chance to the audience to uh, ask any questions? Yeah, yeah, more than happy to. If you look yes, on the you can see my golden, golden Richard on the bed. Senator, I'm Dr. Irandika. You know, it's, it's a nice yes, presentation, hey, actually, very informative and highly impressive with your, I mean, uh, the new knowledge. And uh, my basic question is that, uh, uh, do you recommend any, any any biochemistry analysis or this blood analysis in detecting and diagnosing uh, tumors? Is there any value of that or important? So, I mean, it's very um, difficult to do that, isn't it? It's so, so far, it's only done in humans. It's not done even in specialists. I know they are coming with some biomarkers that they are developing at the moment, but it is not commonly used in veterinary practice yet. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not something that we sadly have access to. I mean, uh, do you do you see any blood picture changes or changes in biochemistry when there are too much, uh, you know, I mean, malignant yeah, going yeah, on in the body? Absolutely. So if you what think of things? cats, okay, so cats with lymphomas, you see hypercalcemia, insulinomas, you see, you know, glucose level declining. I usually see them in a state of hypoglycemic shock. Um, you know, anal gland adenocarcinomas, you see hypocalcemia. Um, the increased ALP is, like I said before, um, is an indication to look at your osteosarcomas. Um, that's kind of, I mean, you can have your thyroxine levels increase with, you know, uh, thyro thyroid tumors. Yeah. So there's plenty of evidence. So that's where, when you yeah. do have a picture where nothing else fits, you want to yeah. think about tumors as an option, as a, as a likely cause. Dr. Senova? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yesterday also I got some case, uh, the mask around the rectum. Yeah. Right. Uh, so I decided to cut and remove. Yeah. Is it was it in the rectum or outside the rectum? Outside the rectum. Yeah. Um. What's the question? Sorry. So, uh, what uh, the the thing is, we doesn't have uh, biopsy and other diagnostic tools, no. So yeah. one option is cut and remove. So I did it, but uh, yeah. I I uh, have seen many cases, uh, some nodules like the structure coming around the rectum. Yeah. What uh, what will be the reason or what type of cancer that will be sometimes? Um, so was it something that you were able to see from outside? Or it's was it something that... It's a uh, nodule. It's, it was an audio or not an audio? Nodule. It's an audio. Yeah, okay. So around your rectum, sorry, your anus, more likely there's three common ones. Your perianal gland adenomas, your perianal gland adenosarcomas, and thirdly is your anal slac adenomas or adenocarcinomas. Those are the three common ones that you see. Within the rectum or colon, one of the common things that I see is the... Um, what is the word for it? Uh, they're, they're basic um, benign uh, polyps. That's the word, sorry. So I've done where I've actually put sutures in, pulling the rectum out and resecting polyps. Um, one of the other nodules that you commonly see could be lymphomas as well. Um, you do have um, your uh, medial, medial iliac lymph nodes quite close to the rectum. So if you soon feel like one or two nodules, you can always have prostate, prostatic tumors that do migrate upwards. Um, and then more, if it's in the wall itself, I'll be worried about leomyosarcomas or leomyomas, which is a, uh, the proper pronouncing is leomyomas, but it's pronounced, it's written as L-E-I-O. 
uh, so I pronounce it leomyomas. So that's um, what to do with your muscle tumors. So it could be any one of those. Um, was it a boy, male dog or a female dog? Uh, it, um, yesterday one, uh, male one. Male one, yeah. So I'll be, if it wasn't castrated, I'll be more worried about something like a perineal gland adenomas where castration is the treatment of choice. It's a hormonal one. Um, but yeah, um, it, there, is a, there is a big list, basically. I know you can utilize um, the uh, R3 labs and things that they're quite good. I know PetFit sends to R3 lab, if I'm not mistaken, uh, if someone can on PetFit can confirm. But um, And otherwise, I think our clinics should start sending it to Peralinia. And I think we should start utilizing the pathologist there and, and looking into, you know, going into knowing what your tumor is before you go remove it. Because the intention, again, is to become curative and not just cut it out. That's the point of the entire. Like, if I can, if you want to take one thing out of this, is to always go with the curative intent. Okay, thank you, Dr. Samuel. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other questions from the audience? So, uh, uh, Jason, I have another question, and uh, you recommended psychotherapy yeah. treatment for the squamous cell carcinoma, right? Um, I mean, we get some skin lumps, like as you know, presentation all over soft the body. Soft. Like, uh, yeah. You know, so soft yeah, soft. Soft. yeah, yeah, yes. And uh, we sometimes, you know, practice that in the you know the Mark Markman or regime that we increase chin together with cyclophosphamide, right? Yeah. And uh, yeah, so my experience is actually when we give that uh, for the first time, the tumor goes down and, you know, the animal gets settled quite nicely. Yeah. And uh, within few, maybe two, three weeks. And after a while, it, it, it recurs again in, you know, but it's in very aggravated, you know, manner, right? You know, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. for the second time. So uh, do you, how, how do you actually manage those cases like, you know, with chemotherapy? Um, I think it's a do with two folds. Number one is yeah. um, okay. when Christine and cyclophosphamide are cytotoxic cells. So you can, if you don't use enough of your drug, you, what you do is you basically destroy the weaker cells and you leave the stronger cells behind. And then the stronger cells multiply okay. this by the cytotoxic. Number two is it's 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 a hard one to explain because I don't know why exactly it's more of a very you know very it's beyond surgical oncology, but it's adaptation. Um, it's it's if you're it's similar to what bacteria does. You know, if you expose them to yeah. enough antibacterials, they learn to live out it and then spread. Um, and I, I, I squamous cell carcinoma was a very aggressive tumors. Um, and unless there is a surgical, intel, a surgical curative approach to it, they never really disappear with my, uh, with chemotherapy alone. Okay. Yeah. So especially ones that I see with cat's noses and things like that, I do cryotherapy. So if you have access to liquid nitrogen, I do them. One of the things that I do with, I do complete nasal plenum resection. I sadly don't have any pictures. Um, but, um, and then if it's on the ear tip, I do ear penectomies, um, at the basis. So those are things that you can do, but I mean, in Sri Lanka, you're at the very center, you're exposed to UV lights and we do have a lot of white cats and white dogs. That's kind of the biggest factor why they come up. And Senator, I have just one more question, last one, maybe here. Yeah. Sure. And uh, yeah. with regard to the salivary gland tumors, like, you know, or some, some growths in the cervical area. Okay. Uh, yeah. Have you come across those cases in common in Australia? Or, I mean, uh, because we get uh, sometimes. I've never quite, seen a salivary yeah. gland. Yeah. I've never seen a salivary Sali gland tumor. I, I don't know. I don't know if it's tumor or, you know, something seat. like Senator. Those? Yeah, I mean, just under the, you know, the, yeah. this uh, there's what we call area. A... So... Yeah, so there's what we call a salivary gland mucosal. It's it's yeah, a salivary yeah, be, gland. Yeah. yeah, just expanding. Um, you do have to remove that salivary gland completely and the duct. Just draining that doesn't do anything. Um, yeah. So there's different approaches. If you do look at 
um, one of the books, it'll, it varies. So you have your zygomatic just under the ear, which has a different approach. Then you have your mandibular one that's different. Then you have your sublingual one that's quite different as well. Those are the three common ones. But then you have your parotid gland just under the, um, sorry, the parotid gland just under the ear, but then you have your zygomatic just here between the bones as well. Um, there is different approaches to removing them. Um, I don't see it as often as I used to see in Sri Lanka. It's one of those few surgeries that I do miss. I used to see it a fair few in Sri Lanka. I think like I'm, I'm quite jealous about the surgical caseloads in Sri Lanka sometimes. Yeah, Dr. Senora. Yes. Yeah, in Sri Lanka, it is very common cancer in uh, ear pin the cats. Yeah. Uh, so... so, most common tumor that you get at the tip of the ear pinna is number one, you want to make sure it's, it's not um, like a mosquito bite dermatitis. That's a common thing in cats as well, which people don't realize. Number two is most commonly squamous cell carcinomas. So if you, I'm, I'm, hopefully you can see what I'm showing in my ear, but if you have your tip there, you can reset at the base circumferentially and then close it up. I, I did a ear penectomy like a week ago as well. Um, we see them in almost all white cats who are outdoors. Uh, and if you look at your cases as well, either they've got white ear tips or no hair, a lot of the time it comes at the ear tip because that's where if you look at a cat close by, they don't have a lot of hair. Um, close in that and it's UV radiation causing it. So you can do complete ear penectomies. Um, you don't have to take the canal out, but you can just, yeah, easily do them. Um, again, I take electrocautery because they tend to bleed a lot. You can, like, you know, if you are doing surgeries, you can get an electrocautery machine for not too expense. Like if you are willing to spend about 300,000 rupees, you can get a good quality electrocautery machine, which is going to make your life so much better. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, normally we have, do with that electrocauterizer now. These days it's yeah. available. In yeah, yeah. I think it's a fantastic instrument. I, I don't touch a tumor without an electrocautery. <laughs> yes, thank you. Any other questions, uh, Mr. President? Uh, no, so I'm, yeah, I'm okay. So you let like, check from the audience so they, they have and then, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what about others in the audience? Please, uh, uh, you can type in the chat box or you can directly ask from our resource person, Dr. Sandra, today. Okay, I'll, I'm more than happy to answer questions if you want to send me emails and I'll, I'll pass my email address to Dr. Sugat so he can pass it around. If anyone has any questions, I'm more than happy to answer. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Sandra, uh, maybe later we will get some uh, questions about the uh, lecture from the uh, membership. I will forward yeah. them to you later. Sure. Uh, at the time, shall we wind up the session, Mr. President? Okay, so that, yeah, it's time for me to spend, yeah, leave now. Okay. okay. Uh, 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 thank you very much, Dr. Senra, for your presentation today. It's a very nice one. On behalf of the 73rd Executive Committee, I take this opportunity to extend our most sincere gratitude to uh, Dr. Sedura, who accepted our invitation as a resource person despite your busy schedule. Uh, we believe the knowledge you have shared will help immensely to improve our knowledge, uh, skills, uh, especially uh, how to take the biopsy and the surgery technique, uh, tissue grafting, very useful, useful for us. Uh, and also, I would like to thank the participant today, the student doctors uh, who participated today to make this workshop a success. Thank you very much, Dr. Sandra. Thank you. I will, I'm quite happy to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Sandra. Yeah. No, my pleasure. Thanks. Thank you for having me. Thank you.